It's already turned on. There we go. Now you guys are in trouble. I got the mic. No. But there's a big clock in the back that tells me when to sit down, so don't feel too bad. Dude. And then Jim will get the hook and pull me out too. Um, I don't know. I, I am hoping that all of you knew. Um, we've shifted the order of things so that uh, list of Core 52 classes that uh, Zach sent out in like January, February of this year of what we were doing, we switched it up a little bit and, and um, some people got it, some people didn't. So we are talking today about our Core 52 chapter 22 about the golden rule on page 147 in our books. Um, now, the, the best thing uh, about this is I'm hoping that some of you are going to remember being raised with the golden rule as much as I was raised with the golden rule. Because when I was a kid, th that was like the rule. I mean, and Jesus himself says here in Matthew seven twelve, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. It really does cover everything. And so ever since I was, I don't really remember my uh, kindergarten or first grade. But ever since second grade, every single teacher I had, every single adult in my life that I had, I remember specific situations that every single time I did anything wrong, and I was a mischievous boy, and I was raised on Dennis the Menace, so I liked that role model, so I was a menace. And I had an older sister, so I was a double menace because I had to provoke her at all opportunities. Every single adult would say, John, what would you want others to do to you? Will you please treat your sister that way? Will you please treat this friend that way or that teacher that way? We pulled pranks on teachers in seventh grade that we'd go to jail for now. But they were funny pranks in our opinion, but you know, you can't do those things anymore. And I just think of those things. And that teacher that sat me down called me out on everything. And he, even at, at age 13, is saying the same thing that I heard since I was seven years old. Remember hearing since I was seven years old. Because this is a powerful lesson to be taught. Now, Jesus is telling us this somewhat at the end of what I consider his greatest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. It's in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. It's listed in, also, in all four of the Gospels, but it's very, very fully listed in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And he is bringing up this rule in um, knowing that a version of this rule has been in society for, for hundreds of years. Because even 500 years B.C., Confucius said something similar to this, don't do to anyone what you would not want them to do to you. And then even a couple hundred years, in, um, it's not in the uh, Hebrew Old Testament and it's not in our Protestant Bible, but in the Catholic Bible, there's some books in between the Old Prophets and the New Testament. And one of those books is called Tobit, T-O-B-I-T. And Tobit was the person in the book of Tobit. And he had said, don't do anything to others that you don't want them to do to you. So he again just kind of quoted Confucius. But Jesus flips that because in my opinion... Anytime I was away from my sister, I wasn't doing anything bad to her. So I was obeying Confucius and Tobit when I was just away from my sister or away from those people that I used to just find fun po poking. But Jesus flips that and he, said, he calls me to do something way different than just don't do. He's telling me how I'm supposed to act. It's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the attitude now. I am supposed to be something that I wasn't because I was a mischievous boy. I was a prankster. I, my, my sister would have other adjectives for me, but 
I was not a nice little brother. I wasn't a nice student. I, I liked being the class clown. I liked doing stuff. And, and actually, I thought I was really funny with my sarcasm. But I, I, they were cutting. And then you start to think, do you want to be talked to that way? Do you want to be treated that way? That's where Jesus calls you out. And that's why here in Matthew uh, chapter 7, verse 12, <clears throat> he covers so much. He's wrapping up his sermon. He's wrapping up everything else that he had said. And it was good the way he laid everything out. He started the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes. He, he then goes to uh, defining who we are. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. He takes us through how, who God is and who, how much God loves us and that this is what God's laws are and that Jesus himself did not come to destroy the law but to fulfill the law. He, he did so much very systematically in the Sermon on the Mount. And then here we are just a few minutes from the end of his sermon and he says, now this is how I want you to do Everything I just said, I want you to be. And so he, he just says, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, and you're going to be good. You're going to fulfill all the law that way. And as we do that, I, I want you to think of <laughs> breaking this verse down a little bit because he says, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. Now, I don't know where your weak spots are. Um, driving, I, I still hate traffic. Um, I'm, uh, I recently, not recently, about five, six years ago, I recovered from my road rage and disgust of Arizona drivers well enough to put a um, North Hills uh, logo on the back of my Jeep. And, and I purposefully had to not do that for almost, well, over 20 years before I did it because I was not a good commercial. And I don't know how many of you people see those other church symbols on backs of people's cars and they're the ones who cut you off or they're the ones that speed by you or they're the ones that, you know, forget which lane they should have been in and they swerve three lanes to get into the Circle K to get their drink instead of just going a little bit further. I was that guy. So I did not want North Hills to be labeled with one of those people. So I got to be that way, and I got to be able to do that because Jesus wants us to be examples to the world. He wants us to treat everybody the way we'd want to be treated. Now that goes the other way too. How in everything can I do this? That means that when people cut me off, how can I show them grace for their carelessness. How can I do that? How can I treat others the way I would like to be treated when I'm carelessly in a hurry and I rush through a door and it slams on them because I didn't hold it open? And how do I want how do I want to react to that just like how do I want them to react to me when I do those things? Because Jesus is telling us in everything, do this. And now, everything's a big word. I mean, it's all inclusive. It means in everything, in every way, in every moment of every day, I've got to be more thoughtful and filter what is my reaction supposed to be? How am I supposed to be treating others? If I'm, I'm not really ever supposed to be too busy because if I see somebody in need, if I was in need, wouldn't I want them to take time to help me? It may be a flat tire. It may be, you know, just handing water out at a curb. You know, but in everything, if I was thirsty, if I was hungry, and, and I struggle with that because I, I, I drive not a lot, but quite a bit, and I, I see these people on the street corners. So um, because I've been tainted, I, was, I worked by, with the 
the state for so long that I know way too much about drug addicts, <laughs> and so I don't trust any to give it money at a street corner. But you know what it doesn't stop me from doing? Is getting that second taquito at QT and me have one and me give that guy sitting outside another one or get two Gatorades and give him one and the taquito. And because if I was hungry, I would want somebody to feed me. If I was thirsty, I'd want somebody to give me a drink. If, if I was emotionally hurting, I'd want somebody to talk to. So maybe I need to start building more time in my schedule. And, and I've got to tell you, I'm working on that. Because <laughs> this has been a tough two weeks. Because I've had to prepare for this lesson knowing that I'm not doing this lesson as good as I'm asking all of us to start doing this lesson. So I want to give you some hints of what I'm coming up with on how we can do this lesson better. And I encourage you afterwards to talk to each other out in the foyer because we've got our little cafe, we've got the coffee machine, we've got water, we've got all sorts of cool stuff. Um, I don't think um, we got any banana bread from Bill today, but, you know, every once in a while we do. But I just encourage you to talk with one another with ideas of how we can do this better. Because he doesn't want us to just jump through hoops. He wants us to mean it. And that's one of the biggest things that I want to add some verses to the Core 52 book. Because in um, Isaiah 1, 11 through 17, it tells us that... Uh, <coughs> do we have that one? Mike, do we have Isaiah 11, 1, 11, or is it a different Isaiah passage? Uh, which, which Isaiah passage is it? Throw it up. They say the same thing. One of them is just a little bit more concise. Isaiah 29, 13. The Lord um, talks about us coming and doing these things. These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. See, we aren't supposed to, in discipline only, bring our gifts to God, bring ourselves to God, bring our actions dedicated to God. We're supposed to mean it. It's supposed to be from our hearts that he wants. And, and that's what Jesus really called out the Pharisees and the Sadducees on because they were the most obedient and disciplined and righteous looking people. But Jesus knew their hearts. They were doing it for themselves. I don't, I don't come up here to, to share with you because this is a job. I come up to you and share with you because I love you. Because I love Jesus and I love talking about Jesus. And that's what always scares Pastor Zach and Ashley and, and the team. Because, man... You don't want to ask John to talk about Jesus because he won't shut up. I got, my joke is I have not always been a pastor, and I've got some really cool friends that, that accept me that way because I've got stories from my past that I am ashamed of personally, but I glorify God with externally because... He is amazingly capable to forgive us of every sin we've ever done and anything we've ever done wrong or incorrect and to change us. He can make us change. He knows us. He knows our heart. He, has, he gave his one and only son to die on the cross so that we would have the power to in everything treat others the way we want to be treated. Because that encompasses the entire law of the prophets and Moses. Now, in, in counseling, in psychology, I use that a lot because I do a lot of counseling, is there are stages to change. We need to, first and foremost, step out of our denial or oblivion. I hope everybody understands that it's okay to be not okay that we are inherently not good anymore. We have this thing called original sin that ever since Adam and Eve sinned from decades, from centuries, eons ago, when that sin entered earth, we 
we're forever doomed to have evil in our heart. Our natural self is not going to think of the right thing to do. That's why I, I like little things like the golden rule because then we get to have skills to change because after we step out of our denial and oblivion and realize that we are in need of help, we have to make a plan. We need to recognize exactly what it is we need to change. Now, a lot of us have little things. Some of us had really big things that needed to change. But we recognize those things and we list them. And then the third stage of psychological change is you make a plan to change those things that you've recognized you need to change. And then after you have that plan, you act on it. you got to act. Now, most of the time, and Ecclesiastes tells us this too, that we're going to need somebody to help us do that. We need accountability partners. We need helpers. Um, some of you have spouses. Some of you have family members that you can lean into. Some of you at least have friends, neighbors you can lean into. Let them know something you want to change. Um, one of the things that I really, really wanted to change was my driving habits. So whenever my older grandkids are in the car, and definitely my wife in the car, they know that they can correct me. Now, I didn't have to give my wife credit. She already knew that she was going to correct me well before I realized I needed to be corrected. But she, she does. And then even my kids, my grandkids, they know that I don't want to get that way. So sometimes they reset me. And they just say, do you want to try that again? <laughs> do, um, is that really the way you want to react? And they call me on it, especially if they see me go into the horn. That's, that's when, because my Jeep, I love my Jeep. It's got a great loud horn. And, and especially if they see that hand get to that position right there, they go, do you want to? And I'll, no, I don't. I don't want to, unless I really need to stop them from backing into me or something like that, of course. But we get to make a plan and we get to act on that plan. And then after we start that new action, then we start to make a new habit. We get into a new routine in our lives. So we maintain that and it becomes the new us. We get to get those old things washed away and changed in our life and new skills and habits started. And then the sixth stage of change is reevaluate. You jump back up here and you recognize, what do I need to tweak a little? What do I need to change totally? What do I need to build on? And then you go through those stages again. And that way you get on an upward spiral so you get to go to where God really wants you to be because he doesn't want us to struggle the way we struggle down here. And he doesn't want us to treat each other the way we're treating each other down here. How do we want to be treated? Think about that. And how will that change? If you use that as a filter, how will that change the way you interact with other people? So if we look at this in everything, in every moment of every day, in every way, how can we do what Jesus would do? Now, back in the 90s, I don't know how many of you may still have them. We had that WWJD bracelet that used to really help us. Now we have a lot of these little bracelets that tell us um, Bible verses that might mean something specific to us to, you know, don't be anxious, like what Coop and um, Jim were singing about. And, and sometimes we just have to remind ourselves of how unbelievably holy and awesome God is. And some of these Bible verses are really good. One of the things that I wear this purple one for, though, is for mental health. Because I've uh, had uh, some very close people in my life uh, commit suicide. And guys, I got to tell you, everybody's got something big going on. I heard uh, one of our fellow pastors uh, years ago, Rob, Robin Wood, uh, say that. And it really kind of opened my eyes. Everybody's got something big going on. And it really hit with me. Not only that I need to remember that in how do I respond to others, but I need to remember that so I can listen to other people better. Because everybody's got something big.
If you feel when, even if you're just like at a cafe and you're, and you're eating and, and you sense something. My wife and I were just at a restaurant and, and she, she said, you know, they're really stressed over there. That server's really stressed. And I said, why do you think that? Now, again, I, I, I thought I had a good emotional quotient and pick up on those things, but my radar was off because I was watching a football game. <laughs> Distractions are my enemy. ADD is my enemy. And so I, I, I listened to that. And, you know, it, it was wonderful because, again, that reset me and it got me not only off the football game focus for that server, but also, you know, if I'm missing that for my server, I'm sure I'm missing any cues my wife's shooting at me too. So I, I don't have any idea who won the game, but I, I started to focus on who I'm with, not something out there. And then we started talking to her. And just watching my wife, just little phrases, just asking nice things. And, and the cool thing is my wife will always ask somebody, oh, I love your nails. Tell me about that. And then uh, girls have a story behind why their nails look the way their nails look, evidently. And um, my wife asked her that. And just to see the stress level decrease in this young lady because somebody just asked him a simple question. Just spending time. And then, you know, she, she was still going like a whirlwind. She was really busy, but she wasn't stressed anymore. All because somebody just slowed her down and got her to focus. And that's what I love this passage does. Because wouldn't you want somebody to do that to you if you're kind of in a, in, in a nervous state? If you're a little too busy, if you're a little distracted, get you refocused? Because we have so many examples in our life of when we did it right and when we did it wrong. I um, did a funeral for a, a brother of a friend of mine. He died at 61, which is young, way younger than me. So that always scares me right away. And it was just a heart attack. Just happened. And as I'm sitting there and talking to all these people who are going through this loss of this wonderful man, good friend, good brother, just great worker, just retired a year and a half ago. And I, I loved the stories that they told because he did to others exactly the way I would want somebody to do things to me. He, there was never somebody who needed something fixed that he not only didn't help them fix, but teach them how to fix it next time. He was the, he was the example of if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, but if you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. That was him. I had amazing stories time after time as people just kept coming up, and which is always scary at a funeral because, you, you know, you kind of wonder how much time it's going to take. Well, usually you have, you know, four or five, six people come up. There were a bunch more than that who came up and told these stories. And it was beautiful because we got to celebrate this person who, again, he, I don't know where he was on, on the acceptance of Christ scale. I don't know. But what I do know is that he did better than I have done at my times in that way of helping people, reaching out to people. And again, those things will, will call you out to make your own changes because treat others the way you want to be treated. Now, Je Jesus tells us that he... Um, wants it to be a matter of our heart. He wants us to be genuine. That passage in, in uh, Isaiah that we just read told us he doesn't want our emptiness. There's a much longer one here in Isaiah eleven seventeen. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord. 
I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. Again, remember, the Old Testament, they had to do certain sacrifices for certain levels of sins that they did. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you? This trampling of my courts. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moon, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. This is the prophet Isaiah saying this in chapter 1. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. That's what God wants us to do. Now, a passage that we do have up here is Micah 6, 8. Because the prophet Micah encapsulates all that. And he says, God has shown us. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly. To love mercy. You're going to make mistakes. So love mercy. Give mercy. And to walk humbly with your God. Be humble. None of us are good at this. None of us are doing a great job. We can only do as good a job as we know how to do. And that's what God wants, though, is our best. He doesn't want rituals. He doesn't want obedient observance. He wants meaningful. If you come here on Easter Sunday, don't come here because it's Easter Sunday and, you know, Christmas and Easter are the two big Sundays so you want to go to church. No, come here because you're excited to be with your brothers and sisters and talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the, the joy and the love we have because of that resurrection of Christ. Don't come out of observance or obedience. Come because you want to be here. That's what we care about. That's what Jesus cares about. Now, um, James, who wrote the book of James, is the half-brother of Jesus, Joseph and Mary are James's um, parents, of course, and Mary and God are the father of Jesus, or parents of Jesus, so half-brothers. But James grew up as the younger brother of Jesus. Now, he watched Jesus grow up, behave all the time, certain ways. Now, we know because Jesus, even at age 12, he's, you know, like teaching in the synagogue and he, <laughs> they, they leave without him and they have to turn around and come back and get him because the kid's teaching in the synagogue. And, and then he acts like, w w why, mom? Why are you looking for me? Wouldn't you think I'd be in my father's house? And just the humor of that because he's just, from the beginning, I have a very close friend who, who struggles with believing that Jesus wasn't a typical teenage boy because typical teenage boys are not good people. And, and so, but I, I, I argue that and I tell him, yeah, he was different. He stood out. He's always stood out from his birth to his death. He's unique because he was God, is God. And so we have all these talks, a funny banter, but it's, it, it's humorous to have friends who chat with you like that. And teenage Jesus was an amazing young man. James te tells us in the um, mm, passage in James is 127. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Where do you think he learned that? Because James was not a follower of Jesus when Jesus was alive and he was doing all this preaching. Jesus was not, uh, James was not hanging around Jesus then. He had sibling rivalry. He wasn't close with Jesus until after the resurrection. And then he said, whoa, I had 
this available to me, and I was jealous of it. I, I didn't get close. And, and James writes in, with such authority of his knowledge of the real essence of Jesus in his book of James because he does remember what he was raised around. And that's so fantastic because those are the lessons that we get to learn. Jesus shows love. He just shows love. He showed no judgment. He didn't even judge the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He just pointed out the truth and let it simmer inside them. Unfortunately, most of them seethed. And then he even explains how we can do this passage in 7.12. Because when we are asked to, in everything, do unto others as you would like them to do to you, he tells us that means everybody. And later on in Matthew, it talks about how, and our example is in Luke from our book, Core 52 tells us the passage in Luke about the Good Samaritan. And that is Jesus' best parable to explain to us, do unto others as you would like them to do to you in everything, in every way, every day. Because he gives us the Good Samaritan story. A priest or pastor, whichever you want to look at, is walking down the street and he sees this guy that's been beat up. And, and he's a hot mess. Probably looks like a homeless guy on the side of the road. And he crosses to the other side and he walks past him. And then a Levite, one of the people from the family of Levi who are assigned to do the law of Moses, walked by, went to the other side and passed him. But a Samaritan who isn't even supposed to talk to and and befriend a Jew is coming up and he has pity on the man. He's sad for the situation. So he fixes him up. He, he helps him up. He dresses him up. And as a matter of fact, he realizes, man, you, you need some better care. So he takes him to an inn and he pays for the inn and to pays for the care of him. And then he goes on his way. But he made sure the guy was safe and in good care. What would you want to do if somebody mugs you on the side of the road, for them to just drive by because they're afraid? Or is it somebody to come and help you? It's tough. Now, this may mean we may have to stand at a safe distance and call 911 to get police or something because if you're in a dangerous area, I understand that. But don't just go by them. Don't just leave them. How can we do every experience of our lives the way we want it to be done to us. I call that a filter. So just filter it, measure it. And as you do that, I think you're going to find that this Christian life is way easier. We don't have to question ourselves. We don't have to ask 20,000 people their opinions. We can just say, what does the book say? Now, I do encourage people to, to read the Sermon on the Mount as frequently as they possibly can. I think it is, it is as educational as the Psalms are soothing. But I think it's one of the most concise sets of words that Jesus gives that tells us how, not only how to live, but how to live the way we are, he's asking us to live. So I encourage you to do that. But please, whatever you do, don't just memorize stuff. Wealth of words... <laughs> my time. Don't just be a wealth of words, but please change your life. That being said, let's pray. Father God, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we praise you for the words here in Matthew 7, for the, all the words on the Sermon on the Mount, every word that's in the Holy Bible, we praise you for because they are words to teach us, not to condemn us to show us our need not to depress us, to encourage us, to empower us, because in the power of the Holy Spirit, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have the power to change because you have changed us and declared us chosen.
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.